For our next speaker, I'll have to be very careful with my words because he's actually a colleague of mine. Rob is one of the wittiest members of the team and is a pleasure to have in any Slack channel. Being my boss, Rob has had an opportunity to react, redact any further content. Rob is a principal with Deloitte's platform engineering practice. With his broad experience as an analyst, solution designer, and technical lead on container platform, API, SOA, and enterprise integration across a variety of sectors in both public and private. Rob will be speaking today on your next 100 APIs. Welcome, Rob. All right. Thanks, Ashley. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Yep. All good. All right. Let's make a move. Uh, welcome, everyone. Hope you've been having a great day so far. Uh, let's get into it. So it's 2020. It's never been easier to code your first API. Right, you, you, you whip out some Spring Boot, you go create your, your resource, your entity, stick a couple of annotations on it, go create a repository, stick some, uh, stick some annotations on, application, and we're done, right? That's a fully functioning REST API. But what about the next 100? All right. Coding a single API is easy, but growing a valuable ecosystem of your APIs is hard. You need to think, what API should I build? So, so that I get some return on that investment I'm putting into building. When should I build them? So I get that return as fast as possible. So I, I get momentum, I get some you know, cash coming in, I can keep, keep moving. Why should I build some APIs and not others, right? I want to stay lean and not have too much wasted effort. And how should I organize those APIs, right? So we can stay agile, so we can encourage reuse, uh, and so we can scale, and scaling both the technology as well as the teams that are building those APIs. So why do we build an API, Rob? Well, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked. We should build an API for one of two reasons. We're enabling a business process of some sort. Um, and by that, right, think outside the box a bit. Monitoring, automation, QA, test automation, et cetera, they're all processes. And the other reason is to unlock your data. And uh, you've heard that, that saying, data is the new oil. Right, so you gotta you gotta get it out of the ground and into the pipes, out to the people who need it. If you build your APIs without a good reason, then you're working somewhere with too much spare money. That's that's the long and short of it. There has to be uh, a reason, a rationale for the development work that you're doing. So to enable a process or to unlock that data, we first have to understand it. And to scale our delivery, we have to plan far enough ahead so that we can coordinate the people who are doing that delivery. So you might have heard the, the phrase, just enough design initially, Jedi. And this is, this is what we're talking about. Um, we need just enough design initially. We need an agile kind of API architecture approach that can lead us as well as keep up with us at the same time. Uh, so there's a number of ways to kind of think about this. Um, I really like the, the Scale Agile framework, the SAFE framework. Um, I, I'm sure many of you kind of heard of that or you might be working in an organization that uses SAFE. Um, but SAFE has a really good definition of Agile architecture. And it's kind of this, this architecture that evolves over time it avoids overhead, right? We're not talking about these huge, big upfront design phases, all of that kind of thing. Um, we're trying to balance emergent design, so letting teams you know, test and learn and, and change and adapt, but there's also an intentionality to it. 
right? You use your your experience, your um, your industry standards, your reference architectures, um, your your current technology. Like, what do you have to play with right now? That all factors into the API architecture that you're putting together. And finally, it's really, really important when we do this to take a step back, look at the whole system that we're putting together across the full value stream, right? The value of an API is not the API that just your team is building. It's when you pull the APIs from multiple teams together and get a full end-to-end. -end. You compose those together in a new value stream, and that's where the value comes from. It's really important uh, when we talk about architecture like this, right, people people can get too lost in the weeds, try to boil the ocean. We're not. We're focusing on structure, on coordination, on giving ourselves enough architectural runway to, to keep up um, with our API devs and particularly our digital product teams. So how do we get this kind of agility? Um, a lot of it comes from respecting the domain, as in domain-driven design domain. And APIs love DDD. Do you really want to think about APIs around your domain aggregates? Um, not tables, right? That's the old trap. Your, your API isn't simple CRUD on top of database tables. Um, we're thinking of domain aggregate, something that makes sense to the business. And around a domain aggregate, what can you do to it? You can send it commands, tell it to do things. You can ask it questions with queries. And that aggregate can tell you when things happen through events. So commands and queries, obviously, they're kind of very, very service oriented, request reply kind of pattern. So they're sitting on your, your service interface, your, your kind of traditional REST API, that kind of thing. Your events, they're coming through um, an event stream API. It could be a Kafka topic, could be an RSS feed, uh, that kind of thing. And a really important thing that we're trying to get to is this kind of an equivalence, like a, um, a correlation between all these things, right? You, you create, you've you got your customer aggregate. Uh, so your command, you're writing a you know, post to customers um, and you should get an event saying customer one, two, three created. If you received an event saying customer four, five, six updated, you should be able to go back through that query API, you know, get customers four, five, six, get that same representation. It's the same aggregate, the same state, the same entity that we're looking at through different lenses of API. Um, one thing that's happened recently um, is events have gotten a huge leg up in the whole API definition space. So out on the uh, out on the left, um, you see Open API or Swagger if you're old like me. Um, but on the on the flip side, we've now got async API. Um, I'm not sure if if maybe some other speakers have talked about this uh, in APIs API days. If you take one thing away from API days 2020. Async API, go look it up, um, wrap your head around it, fantastic protocol. And it, it borrows so much from, from open API, right? The, the schemas, the content types, the way you structure that definition. So it's, it's putting your whole language you use to describe APIs. And now we have the same language basically to deal with, uh, the service interfaces and the event interfaces. So, Really, really fantastic. Uh, new, still a little bit kind of bleeding edge. Tooling isn't quite there, but getting some massive momentum. Um, another thing to really think about as you expand your API program is that APIs are about more than REST. And we want to be open-minded about the API protocols that we use, but we want to be really mindful of using open API protocols, right? Interoperability is the name of the game. There's no, there's no point in writing an API that's hard, hard to consume. 
So what can we use? We have REST APIs. That's like a default go-to option. The tooling's fantastic. Framework support's fantastic. Um, particularly when you don't control the consumers of your API. So if they're out facing business partners or the public, REST fantastic option. GraphQL, um, again, really good for when you have a really rich interlinked data model, um, mostly read-only. Uh, I'm sure the speakers on either side of me will, will kind of protest that. Um, GraphQL can do data updates, but it's not its sweet spot. Um, when you have many consumers, they all have slightly different needs. And when you're looking mostly at individual record access, um, GraphQL really, really shines. Um, gRPC is quickly coming up as a, as a really valid choice here. Uh, fantastic for internal APIs, for microservice communication, for that east-west traffic. Um, can be really, really high performance. Um, and also good for really frequent changes, right? Because Google protocol buffers, which is the, the data representation format inside gRPC, it's kind of got baked in schema evolution. So the kind of breaking changes that would mean you'd have to version a REST API, gRPC, you just add another field on the end um, and everyone keeps working fine. Um, on the flip side, so on the event streaming side, we've got kind of event streaming technologies, Kafka being the most prominent, um, really good for very high volume, real-time events for event sourcing patterns becoming hugely important, um, and really for like an enterprise-wide kind of real-time data distribution backbone. Um, that's, yeah, that's, that's really coming up as a, as a very strategic use case for those event streams. Um, Another option is um, standardized messaging protocols. So MQTT and AMQP, Advanced Message Queuing Protocol in particular. Uh, again, these are like standardized wire format protocols. So interoperability is really good. So good for public facing event streams where you don't own the, the other consumers. And the last one on the list, which um, is probably controversial enough to, to need its whole its own slide, which luckily I have created. Um, SQL. So anyone remember the Bezos mandate from way back 15 years ago? Um, teams expose their data through service interfaces, no direct reads of another team's database, but most importantly, it doesn't matter what technology you use. SQL can make a really good service interface if you govern it like one. So versioning, backwards compatibility, stable contract with your consumers. Um, but SQL, it's, it's really efficient. It offers your bulk data consumers heaps of power, flexibility, really powerful query language, and you don't have to code it from scratch. Um, and if you don't believe me, go take a look at Google BigQuery, the interface into which is SQL. All right, so enabling business processes. Um, there's some agile discovery techniques when you're working in your, in your teams. They're really, really good for teasing out the business process and the APIs that you need to support it. Um, event storming is probably the most useful in this space. All right, you look at the, it's exactly the concepts we're talking about. Domain aggregates with events, with commands, right? You're doing this uh, up, on a, up on a board with your, with your stakeholders, you're, and it's gonna translate really directly into the APIs and events that you wanna build. Uh, user storing mapping also can be quite helpful. Um, particularly working out kind of you're seeing that end-to-end -end process and you're getting a timeline kind of view as well, right? So you're, you're seeing which APIs you're going to need to build first up to unlock a bit of value in your MVP and then get subsequent releases to enrich it. And when you do this discovery, you're really looking for opportunities for reuse. Um, 
reuse in terms of common utilities like um, content templating, communications, email, SMS, that kind of thing, and common domains, um, you know, your, your customer payment, that kind of thing. Um, UI specs can be useful when you're planning out new APIs, but you want to be a bit careful. You want to be sympathetic to the UI, uh, particularly in terms of the data that you need to capture, but you want to maintain some channel independence. You want to design your APIs around the process flow, not the page flow, right? Because the, the process flow is going to be a bit more stable, whereas the page flow is going to change as the UX evolves, that kind of thing. Um, front end devs, right? They're grown ups. If they need an experience API, a dedicated back end for front end, go build it themselves. Um, but that is not, don't think about that as being part of your API portfolio, right? Because it's dedicated to just that one channel, just that one user interface. And that channel independence really pays off. Um, for example, we had a, a bunch of APIs that we built to sell phishing permits uh, through a website. And we we gave them all to a, an intern who was with us for two weeks and he built a chatbot interface on top of that. Um, so you can, you can innovate very rapidly on top of a well-designed API layer that's around your, your business process. So we've got this, this analysis, but how do we then turn it into a roadmap for building our APIs? Well, we can do some modeling. Um, Archimate is a, it's a kind of a very simplified UML kind of notation um, for originally for TOGAF, so Open Group Architecture Framework um, Architecture. Uh, it's really, really good for this kind of lightweight architecture modeling, um, helpful relationships between um, between different components in the model, supports this idea of data, right? Aggregates, components, services, events. These are all exactly the concepts we're talking about. Um, and it, it stops you going too deep. Right. This is we're not talking about UML code generation kind of thing. It's a it's an analysis tool to, to talk to teams, to other human beings. Um, so if you if you're familiar with like that horrible old school heavy enterprise architecture, Togafi kind of thing with saying, like, is this the right tool for us in 2020? Um, so we've we've used it, and yes, it is. And when you think about it, if we only ever used a tool for what we originally it was built for, we wouldn't never have invented Node.js. All right, so here's an example um, where we're doing that business process mapping. Um, so based on the yellow components, that's Archimate business layer terminology, if you ever heard that kind of business application technology layering. Um, so here we're kind of using, getting, setting a bit of context, saying the, the user, the role, the persona that they're in, what channel they're coming through, what business service they're, they're making use of. So in this case, it's um, payment processing with still credit cards, that kind of thing. We tie in the data, right? So various data entities that are getting dealt with. Um, and then we're modeling the, the process step by step. And each of those steps is tied down onto application services in TOGAF speak. Um, but these are API operations. Right, so this is where that whole value analysis comes in, right? You've done that analysis. You understand the process. You understand exactly what APIs you're going to need in order to realize some value out of this particular stream. Um, once we've got that, then we start thinking about the organization of those APIs. All right, so we're assigning those operations onto interfaces. Um, and then those interfaces get implemented by components. And if you're mapping an interface one-to-one -one onto components, that's pretty much a microservice kind of architecture. And we're grouping those 
services, those application services around the data that they deal with. And because you're visualizing that, it's you, you start to get a really good idea of how big your various kind of DDD bounded contexts are. And it's really fast. It's really easy to change. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of much, much better to do that thinking and experimenting in a model than it is to go write the code and, and then have to do expensive refactoring later on. Um, in order to do modeling, you need some tooling. A lot of kind of enterprise architecture tools, very expensive, very hard to use. Um, we love a tool called Archie, um, free open source modeling tool uh, based on Eclipse IDE. Um, really good documentation, really good modeling experience, um, heaps of options for kind of custom documentation generation, reporting, all of that kind of thing. Um, and you store the models in a Git repo. So you can get that versioning, you get that collaboration around the, the tool. Um, so yeah, that's a that's a really good, um, really good option. I encourage you to just download that, have a play around with it, see what your um, what your applications look like. All right. Reason number two for APIs, unlocking data. Um, single record kind of get get customer by ID. That's trivial. Um, it's not the it's not the hard thing to do. Um, you want to think about your uh, reporting and your analytics consumers. Right, they have the hard requirements. Really complicated queries, um, large data volumes. Right, you might need a week or a month or a year of historical transactions or every single customer in your data set, for example. And you might want to do some processing on that data before you export it. So quite often with these very large data volumes, complex queries, um, you might want to look into this asynchronous request reply API pattern. So it's more than just a single operation. It's kind of a protocol that consumers can take part in. So you're, you're not immediately saying, get me all the customers. You're almost executing, you're creating a batch job that says, go and run this query for me and tell me when the results are ready. I'm going to check the status, you know, poll, is it ready? Is it ready? Is it ready? Yes, it's ready. Go and fetch it. Um, so that, that kind of pattern, very powerful when we deal with these, um, these kind of interfaces. Um, so building the right pipes is important for data, uh, but so is building the pipes in the right place. And once again, this is where DDD comes into play. Um, through this fairly recent concept called data mesh, uh, as opposed to a centralized data lake. Uh, this is not my idea. I have seen it in action. Uh, it's come from the very smart people who work with Martin Fowler over in uh, at ThoughtWorks. Um, very, very interesting concept, really well kind of reasoned out. Um, fantastic to read that article. Um, but the main takeaways are uh, event streams and these bulk data views, these bulk data APIs, they are APIs. And just like your, your CRUD, create customer, whatever, they should be owned by the domain, right? They're still APIs, same rules apply. Uh, and the big shift is those, um, those APIs just aren't just the, they're not just the raw data for data processing pipelines like your etl jobs that kind of thing but they actually encapsulate the result so the data processing pipelines sit inside your your domain and the apis are exposing the results of that so again this comes back to understanding your business understanding your data understanding the process that that data is going to run through uh -huh. um, and that that helps you shape those reporting apis as well Finally, I want to think about uh, event sourcing as being a really, really good API design technique. So remember we talked about event streams and query APIs being equivalent, and we can kind of extend that, that record by record equivalence to the entire data set. 
And when we, if you queried your full data set out of your, your domain, it's kind of the same as replaying the entire event stream that your domain has published. And that can be really, really helpful for both um, data ingest, for, for business intelligence, for analytics, for data lakes, that kind of thing, uh, as well as for data reconciliation between systems. So in conclusion, building a next API, 100 APIs, means planning far enough ahead to not get into trouble. And you can use these tools, domain modeling, process mapping, agile architecture, to help you build out that plan. Every team's journey is going to be different. You will you will learn, you'll adapt, you'll you'll experiment, you'll fail. That's fine. But you want to always come back to the idea that you you want to be explicitly unlocking some value, realizing some value at every step, because that's the only way your next hundred APIs is going to be around long enough to become your next thousand APIs. Thank you. Questions. Awesome. Thanks, Rob. For the time, great, you've uh, closed your screen. Uh, so firstly, we have sort of a comment asking, they said your slides are great. Will we have access to them in any way? Uh, I think so. I think the presentations, like I think the videos get recorded from each of the sessions. Um, I'll double check with the people that let us put slides in places and find out if we can, if we can share the slide content. Great, thank you. The next one is how would you apply or enforce API security to event streaming? This is really interesting. Uh, some of the API gateway products are starting to uh, infor be able to apply API policies to event streams. Uh, so I think Apogee and Axway in particular um, Solace, the message broker, is coming at that with the messaging engine to start, and they're bringing in policy management on top of that. So it's still a new place, still a new space, but evolving really, really rapidly. Great. Is replaying an entire event stream an implementable, practical approach, though? <sighs> Depends on the event stream. Um, it's very much a theoretical thing. Um, you notice a lot of the frameworks in particular for event sourcing, they allow for kind of snapshot events in the event history. Um, it's, it's a bit of both. There's definitely optimization that can happen there, um, but it's more a way of thinking. Um, so if you actually cared about the entire event stream, you would have been listening from the beginning of time kind of thing, or you would have done an initial data load through a query API to bring you up to speed, and then you're tracking from um, from that point in time on. Good question, Lou. Great. Thanks, Rob. Uh, I think we probably may not squeeze another question in, but thank you for that. Um, really insightful, and, yeah, hopefully anyone out there listening can from 100 to 1,000 APIs with that advice. Awesome. All right. Thank you very much. I'll see you back in the office when it all opens up. <laughs>